a little bit about Pastor Chuck. He is a former pastor at Bethel Grove. Um, it's one of the local churches in the area. Um, more. He also is working with the Chesterton House, um, doing really cool stuff there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nailed it. Um, and he graduated from Cairn University and Dallas Seminary, and a little bit about him is he has eight grandkids. Wow. So please give a round of applause to Pastor Chuck. Okay. 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 It's good to be with you guys tonight. I appreciate the opportunity of uh, being on the campus and just uh, interacting with you and having the privilege of, uh, of sharing some, some ideas and some of the revelation that God has given to us in the scriptures. And it's always a privilege for me to... campus both here at over at Ithaca College and working with the chaplaincy over there as well as just working with a number of the different student groups here on campus as well as part-time over at Chesterton House and uh, it's just a I just thank God for what he's doing at Cornell and just the privilege of being here for about 30 years and uh, so it's just really been neat to see what God has done it's kind of scary though when of course Professor Fick is sitting here and he's been here uh, longer than some of your parents have been alive but um, uh, he had seen students' parents come through here probably. And uh, I remember uh, the guy that started Chinese Bible study came to Bethel Grove. And then I had the privilege of uh, also teaching his son when he came. So uh, it's just a part of the privilege of being in a place long term, I guess. So, uh, but it's going to be with you guys tonight. I've heard a lot of things about Asian IV and through Charles and Kim. At least I get it straight from Kim. You never know where Charles is coming from when he talks, but uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, just beat up the big boys. Just beat up the big boys. <laughs> I don't know very many of you tonight. Uh, I suspect that most of you, a uh, good share of you, are probably followers of Jesus. Uh, I suspect that there are others here who are not followers of Jesus. You may see him as a curiosity of history, and so you're just kind of checking out uh, some aspects of, of the faith. Some of you may come from a background in which you're Buddhist, or Shinto, or maybe you're a part of Islam, uh, or part of some other kind of religion, or you have no religion. And so you're simply here because you're good friends with somebody who says, eh, why don't you just come with me, nothing better to do on Friday night, it's cold out we got some interesting singing, interesting people, and so you're just here because you were dragged here. Uh, but religiously, you don't really care a lot about things, even though there's a curiosity factor, because you've been around enough of those who are followers of Christ to at least give you a curiosity about uh, what they believe and why. Um, but there's one thing that we do have in common, whether you're an avid, zealous follower of Jesus, or whether you're an atheist, or whether you're agnostic, whether you're a secularist, whether you're a polytheist, or whatever ist you want to be. And that which we share in common is that we live on a damaged planet. Things just aren't the way they should be. Uh, it's a broken world. Some of you come from broken homes. Some of you come from broken lives. Some of you have experienced a broken heart, got a broken spirit. And so you realize that things just aren't the way you wish they could be. And so we, we share a common desire that things could be different and that the world isn't a real safe place. I'm sure there's the rise of ISIS. There's the fear of terrorism. 
Over 60 countries are embroiled in some kind of armed conflict at this point. There's strange diseases, there's Ebola. There's all kinds of things that are happening on a global scale that are causing anxiety, causing fear. But one of the beauties about being a college student is that your imagination runs wild on the left side of your brain. And so you just are fired up with the thought. I'm here in Cornell University, a privileged university, part of the top 15 universities in the world. When it comes to service, as the professor said a couple of hours ago, the top five in the world when it comes to service orientation. Part of an Ivy League education. You're now enrolled in a dream factory where dreams maybe can come true. And you look forward to graduating. You look forward to going into the marketplace, into industry, into the academy. And I'm going to make a difference. And I'm going to be one that's going to finally find a cure for cancer. Or as President Scorton said a few months ago, the next Bill Gates may be here on this campus. Or the next Steve Jobs. Or somebody's going to come through with a breakthrough in science or engineering. You're going to be one of those change agents to make the world a better place. And so you're fired up with enthusiasm, that longing to do something, to make a difference, to make sure that this world is better for my kids and for my grandkids. And that's your desire. And that's your passion. That longing exists in every one of us, a longing for something other than what is. And we curiously wonder, was it always like this? Is it ever going to get better? What's going to happen to this world and this universe? I was talking to a woman last night who's a friend of a playwright here in town, and her brother died some time ago, and, and she's not a follower of Jesus. She belongs to a whole different religion. But she's asking the question, where is my brother? Can he see me? Is he still alive someplace? What's going on in his world beyond this world? And, and she doesn't have a frame of reference by which to answer that question. And so she wrote a play which exposes her own questions and her desires. But she longs for something that is more and that is different. C.S. Lewis, the former agnostic, prolific writer, has suggested that if there is the existence of hunger, the reality of hunger in our world and in our bodies. It demonstrates the reality that there's probably food out there. Or as Immanuel Kant once said, as he longed for justice, and most of you are passionate for social justice, the ending of sexual trafficking. It's abhorrent to you that there is injustice in this world. But where did that curiosity for justice come from? if we're simply mechanistic beings with no kind of an orientation bigger than ourselves. And Kant went on to suggest, not as a theist, but if there's justice, there must exist a judge. And if that judge is to exercise justice that is perfect, he himself must be perfect. There must be a perfect judge. And he argued himself into some kind of a theistic position. Part of a larger story part of something that is beyond ourselves. And so tonight I want to kind of explore to you that larger story. Each of you in this room has a story. Every one of your stories is different. It's as unique as your fingerprint. You've got a story that is begun. It's now present. And it's got a future. You and I don't know one thing that's going to happen beyond the present. It's all up for grabs. You don't have any idea. You got plans, you got dreams, you got aspirations, you got ideals, but you're part of a story. And then I want to suggest to you that if you're living in your story, you're living in a very small story. Because the Bible gives us the invitation to step into a larger narrative, a larger story, a universal story, one in which has got a phenomenal ending. And you can be a change agent and one who's a part of that story to make the world a better place and even beyond. That story, and I'm using the Bible as my reference, and so if you're 
not a follower of Jesus and belong to another religion. I just simply say that right at the very front that I start with the scriptures. I start with the Bible as God's revelation. That story begins in the beginning of time when God created. And out of darkness and chaos, he created a beautiful place. It's a perfect place. It had a perfect marriage. Perfect marriage of a couple called Adam and Eve. Perfect relationship with each other, perfect relationship with God, perfect universe, a perfect place that we sometimes say it looks like the Garden of Eden, meaning it's absolutely stunning and beautiful. It's a place of shalom, a place of wholeness, a place of beauty. But something happened because God has made us with choice. He hasn't made us robotic. He's made us with the capacity to choose. And so because in each of us there's a fierce desire for independence, a desire to do our own thing. The first man decided to disobey God. And the result was a brokenness occurred. We may call it the fall of mankind. He fell out of favor with God. He fell out of favor with a spouse. He fell out of favor with creation. So the Bible in another place says the creation now groans. It's under a curse. Things are not the way they should be. It's a disaster. It's a broken world. It's a broken universe. It's been going on for centuries, millennia, for a long time. But way back there when the fall occurred, God had a vision. And he hinted at the fact that I'm going to send somebody who's going to be a rescuer. He's going to restore this place to... Again, a perfect place, a beautiful place, a place of perfect love, of perfect relationships, of perfect reconciliation, of relationships with me, with the creation, and with other people, a perfect community. And then in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, Jesus. He came and he dwelt upon this earth. He lived and eventually was killed. Three days later, he rose again. And he gives to us the hope of a life that is beyond this life. But into this story, Jesus came and he healed. It's beyond that. He invites us to follow him. He invites us into his kingdom. He invites us to be a part of a restoration of this universe, of this world. He invites us to be a part of what he is doing as he's called this world back into relationship, back into reconciled relationship with ourselves, with God, and with the creation. And there's hints of that happening within the communities of those who are followers of Christ. But the grand day is yet to come when that king does return and there will be perfection again on this earth with a new heaven and a new earth. And our little story can be connected to that larger story. And we can be a part of what God is about in restoring the world to be a better place, and he invites us to that enterprise. As Kevin has said, you guys are going through the Book of Acts, which is basically a study of the history of this movement, starting with when Jesus was here. And so it's a historical account written by a physician who's interested in details. And I've been asked tonight to speak on chapter 7, a man by the name of Stephen. Kind of a little known guy, yet a man who had a tremendous reputation. A man who was known for a number of different things. And in this chapter, he gives to us a historical overview. He goes back in time, and he goes all the way through to the time of Jesus. And in this story, we're going to see some things that are going to be instructive for us to see. Because Stephen was a very unique leader. He was a man who made a difference in his world. And I suggest to you that as we read through this account in Acts chapter 7, that you're going to see some insights that are also going to give to you how you can be an effective leader where God is calling you, whether as an economist, as a biologist, in pre-vet studies, in the business, as you move into the academy, wherever it is, what kind of a leader are you going to be? I think that Stephen gives us some ideas as he demonstrates for us how to live. One thing that I find interesting about a worldview that is biblical is that it has a healthy response 
to the core questions that every religion, every philosophy begins to ask. These four questions revolve around four words. Reality, well-being, virtue, and character. Every religion, every ethical system, basically revolves around those four kind of realities. What is reality? What is the good life? What is a good person? What does it take to authentically become a good person? Every religion, every philosophy, dances around those kinds of questions. And there are followers of many religions in seeking to answer that question. I suggest to you today that Stephen was a man who had answers to those questions. He understood reality beyond himself. He was a good person. He understood what it meant to be a man of character. He was a man who made a difference in his world. In fact, he shows us how to live, and curiously, he shows you how to die. And if you don't know how to die, you really don't know how to live. So Stephen shows us that. What I want to do tonight is to give to you some ideas from, from the scriptures in terms of, of this man. And I want to take the time to, to read this chapter for you. <clears throat> so instead of turning to it in your phone, in your iPod, whatever you've got, just do something different <clears throat> and listen to the reading of Scripture. It'll take about five minutes. But since I've been assigned chapter 7, and maybe many of you haven't read this account, I want you to listen to it as I read. And then I'm going to highlight four epics that, hi that Stephen highlights as he gives us a history of the movement. But also, I just want you to listen to the kind of man that Stephen was. Give me a little bit of backstory. This movement that got started <clears throat> in the ancient world in Jerusalem began to multiply and began to grow very rapidly. And like any successful enterprise, began to have a, a necess necessity for a division of labor. And so there were a number of things that were being taken care of, and so they decided that, in particular one area, they needed a better food distribution system. <clears throat> and so uh, they asked for seven men that could be responsible for this. And so Stephen was at the top of the list, a man who was a good man, says he was filled with the Spirit. He's a man who was filled with God's grace, filled with power, and then it lists a number of other men who served with him. He's in a management position. And, um, <clears throat> and then as the movement began to grow, there was a resistance among those who were the Jewish people. Resistance because uh, Jesus had come and he had routed a few paradigms. He had... Uh, said some things that people just didn't understand. But eventually, as you know, they killed him for what he believed in and what he stood for. But Stephen was a man who, who knew Jesus. He loved Jesus. His life was changed by it. And Stephen was the kind of a guy that, uh, as I'm going to indicate to you, there were three facts about Stephen that I think are transferable to you and to me if we want to be a true change agent in this world. So just listen to the text as I read it, please. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue against Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we've heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. And so they stirred up the people, the elders and the teachers of the law. They, they seized C Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified. This fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. 
I'm just before we get into his response, let me just remind you <laughs> that Stephen is a man who had no idea what was coming to him, but he's just been dragged between before the, what is called the Supreme Court of that land, in which, because he was so powerful a man, and he was so articulate in what he had to say that they couldn't argue him out of his positions. And so they employed slander. They brought in people who said, this is what he's saying, even though he really didn't say it. And they charged him up on trumped up charges of being against the temple and against the Torah, the law, the two sacred items of the Jewish people. And they accused him of blasphemy. So Jew, Stephen, being a Jew, knew you get charged with blasphemy. You get killed for that. And so he's up on trumped-up charges, and they're trying to figure out, what is it that you're saying? And so Stephen is asked by the Sanhedrin, by the Supreme Court, and by the judges, is this true or is it not true? Is what they're saying true or is it not? And Stephen then stands before them, And the high priest asked him, are these charges true? To this he replied, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land that I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here not even a foot of ground, but God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said, and afterward they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. And Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days after his birth. Later Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob became the father of the 12 patriarchs. Because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they sold him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. He gave Joseph wisdom and enabled him to gain the goodwill of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So he made him ruler over Egypt and all his palace. Then a famine struck all Egypt and Canaan, bringing great suffering, and our fathers could not find food. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. And Jacob went down to Egypt, where he and our fathers died. Their bodies were brought back to Shechem and placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought from the sons of Hamor at Shechem for a certain sum of money. As the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt greatly increased. Then another king, who knew nothing about Joseph, became ruler of Egypt. He dealt treacherously with our people and depressed our forefathers <clears throat> by forcing them to throw their newborn babies so they would die. At that time, Moses was born. And he was no ordinary child. For three months he was cared for by his father's house. When he was placed outside, Pharaoh's daughter took him and brought him in as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in speech and action. When Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his fellow Israelites. He saw one of them being mistreated by an Egyptian. So he went to his defense and avenged him by killing the Egyptian. Moses thought his own people would realize that God was using him to rescue them, but they did not. The next day, Moses came upon two Israelites who were fighting. He tried to reconcile them by saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you want to hurt each other? But the man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard this, he fled to Midian, where he settled as a farmer and had two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to Moses in the flames of a burning bush in the desert near Mount Sinai. When he saw this, he was amazed at the sight, and he went over to look more closely. He heard the Lord's voice, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. Moses trembled with fear and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, take off your sandals, 
the place where you're standing is holy ground. I've indeed seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I've heard their groaning and I've come down to set them free. Now come, I will send you back to Egypt. This is the same Moses whom they had rejected with the words. Who made you ruler and judge? He was said to be their ruler and deliverer by God himself through the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He led them out of Egypt and did wonders and miraculous signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and for 40 years in the desert. This is what Moses who told the Israelites, God will send you a prophet like me from your own people. He was in the assembly in the desert with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers and he received living words to pass on to us. But our fathers refused to obey him. Instead they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who led us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. That was the time when they made an idol in the form of a calf. They brought sacrifices to it and held a celebration in honor of what their hands had made. But God turned away and gave them over to the worship of the heavenly bodies. This agrees with what was written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the desert, O house of Israel? You have lifted up the shrine of Molech, the star of your god Rephim. The idols made you worship. Therefore, I will send you in exile beyond Babylon. Our forefathers had the tabernacle of the testimony with them in the desert. It had been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. Having received the tabernacle, our fathers took Joshua and brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David, who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. However, by the Most High does not live in houses made by men. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? And Stephen said, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you're just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but you've not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious, gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelled. At the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, began to stone him. <coughs> Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. That's the story of Stephen. It's all basically that we know about him. What he does is that he's charged with blasphemy because he spoke against the law. Allegedly, he spoke against the law and against the temple. And what Stephen does is he goes back and he appeals to the leaders, what I would say are four epochs of history in Jewish history. He starts with Abraham. Abraham, then he goes to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph, to Moses, to David, and to Solomon. And each of those eras of history, each of those persons, all well known to his Jewish audience, he demonstrates that God is not confined to one space. God is not confined to a temple, as they said he was. Because as to Solomon, I built that temple, and God said, I will make my presence there. But the prophets also said, you cannot contain God in a place. And so the Jewish leaders saw the temple as being their focal point. That was the presence of God. But Stephen goes back and he demonstrates with Abraham. Abraham said, I will be with you. Joseph, I will be with you. And Moses, he said, this is holy ground. Take off your sandals. God was present. And Stephen demonstrates throughout history 
that God called out a community of persons beginning with Abraham where he made a promise that I'm going to take of you. I'm going to pull you out of the land of Ur. I'm going to take you over to Canaan. I'm going to make you a blessing among the nations. And from Abraham would come a great nation that would bless all the peoples of the earth. And God would be present with them. So he demonstrates that God is not localized in one place. But he's present in the lives of his people. He's present everywhere. And as he goes through it, he describes the Torah, the law. Even as Jesus said, I did not come to break the law, I came to fulfill the law. And he highlights the story of Jesus. And so that grand narrative, and the grand story, in the fullness of time, when Jesus came, and he announced to the shepherds on that hillside, he said, fear not, I bring you great tidings. I got you good news. And to you is born a savior, a rescuer, a deliverer who's going to make this place a better place. There's going to be peace on earth, peace to all men. Shalom is coming. Jesus is coming. King Jesus is here. And through the coming of Jesus, he introduces that which has existed and promised to Abraham and promised through Joseph and to Moses. And Jesus came fulfilling this covenant, this promise that he made. That I'm going to make a new heaven and a new earth, and his kingdom is coming. And so the shepherds were told, Shalom is coming. Shalom is here. Peace. This is good news. And Jesus comes and he says, The kingdom of God is present. It's here. It's in your hearts. I invite you to become a follower of me. I invite you to have a be a part of the restoration of this creation. I invite you to be a part of my kingdom to make all things new. And Jesus invites us, as he invited the first century, to be followers of him. He invites us into a global enterprise, a global enterprise in which he said, as he announced in his public ministry, I've come to heal the brokenhearted. I've come to set prisoners free. I've come to turn mourning into dancing. I've come to take broken hearts and make you whole again. I've come to make broken relationships and to reconcile them. That was the message. That's good news. Jesus invites us, in the words of one writer, to become a part of his resistance movement, a part of this glorious enterprise to resist that which is happening in our world today. I can remember flying on an airplane a number of years ago. And when I was in pastoral ministry, you know, when you engage in conversation with somebody who's not a follower of Christ, and they ask me the dreaded question, so what do you do for a living? I never like to say I'm a pastor. It immediately just shuts down conversation. Oh, yes. I had a grandfather who was a Methodist clergyman, and somehow they just all of a sudden feel like they've got to, you know, provide some kind of connection to some religion or something. So I decided I was going to change my story. So I remember sitting on a plane, and a guy asked me, so what do you do? I said, I'm a part of a behavioral modification system outfit. He <laughs> said, yeah, it's a, it's a father and son operation. It's a, it's a global kind of an enterprise. We've got offices literally around the world. In every city, most villages. It's, a, it's an amazing company. It's been going on a long time. <laughs> yeah, I, I joined it probably about well, 30 years ago, I guess, and so I've been a part of it. And it's been a part of my family as well. And so it's just really fun. We, we see a lot of modification of behavior and changes. That's really cool. Tell me more about it. And I laughed and I said, let me tell you what I really do. All I just told you is true, but I'm a pastor. And that just kind of breaks the ice. You know, I can have a decent conversation. Somebody knows where I'm coming from. At least I, I was able to get into it in that way. But that's what God invites us into. He invites us into a global enterprise to make this world a better place. He invites us to share in him. And what Stephen does in a miraculous way, in a marvelous way, is that he demonstrates incredible knowledge as he charts history. And he demonstrates that his faith is built upon a long line of history, of factual history. Stephen is the kind of a guy who, who with incredible confidence, and I, I look at this guy and I, and I ask myself the question, what is it about this man that made him so distinctive? A man who, when he was chosen, was known as we is filled with God's grace. What is it that was, 
made him stand out so that he was chosen for this managerial position of, of food distribution and, and a key leadership position. What is it that caused him? That as he stood before those who were his accusers, I would have shaken like a leaf standing before the Supreme Court of scholars, the known scholars of his day, and challenged with the kind of questions, and they looked at him and they said, we can't argue this man, he's filled with wisdom, he's full of knowledge. What is it about him that causes him to be like that? When he's slandered, and the priest comes and he says, are these things true? And Stephen could have easily said, no. But he said, friends, fathers, let me tell you a story. I'll go back to somebody that we all know, Abraham. And all of a sudden, he recounts history. What kind of a guy is this? He goes through centuries of history in about five to seven minutes. And then at the end, being someone who knew the law, if he's charged on blasphemy, he runs the high risk of being stoned. He's dragged out of the city. And as the stones come down upon him, he says, Father, don't lay this into their charge. What kind of a guy is this? He's a distinctive leader. He's an unusual man. I want to suggest to you that Stephen is a man that demonstrates among many qualities three characteristics that I think are transferable to you. As I look at Stephen, I see a man who had developed convictions. Convictions that caused him to be a leader. Convictions that when he was faced with slander and maligning, he stood true. Convictions that in the midst of his darkest hour, when he's being stoned to death, he responds with calmness and grace. Are you a man or woman of conviction today? If you're a person of faith, how strong is your faith? Is it becoming steel-like convictions? Are you ready to stand against assaults, temptations? What are your convictions today? I suggest to you that among many, Stephen had three convictions. The first conviction that I see with this man, he was convinced of the person of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Could I say it in theological terms, Stephen had a Trinitarian worldview. He believed in God the Father, in God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. His life orbited around Jesus Christ. That was the so-called secret of who he was. He believed that he was called into a larger enterprise than his own little story. He heard about Jesus. He believed in Jesus. The text says that he was controlled by the Holy Spirit, which means that he didn't trust his own spirit or his own intellect, but he was a man who allowed the spirit to control him. Therefore, to the control of the spirit, the Bible elsewhere says, the fruit of that kind of control is love and joy and peace and patience and long-suffering and self-control. And so he exhibits that. He's a man who is in love, as we sang earlier. A man who deeply believed in the Father, in the Son, in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit invaded his life, transformed him into the kind of man, the leader that he was. And therefore, in his short life, even as a manager of food, the relationship with others, leaders of his own people, he demonstrated, he had the conviction, I believe in the Father, in the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The second conviction that I see that Stephen developed was it God? He's a God of history. And he's in control of history. He's the sovereign God of the universe. Stephen, I don't know what kind of a scholar he might have been. Self-taught. He didn't have any books. Oh, they had the Torah. But that was sacred pages for the priests to read. Everything was oral tradition. So Stephen had listened very carefully. He had studied Jesus. He studied the law. He studied his history. He knew what he believed. So Stephen was a man who understood his own faith system and he came to embrace the fact this God is a God of history and he's a sovereign over the universe. And if God is a God of history, that means he's the God over my story as well. 
And that gives great hope for you and for me. Because God is a sovereign God who in your history, though your history may have some detours, it may have some zigs, it may have some zags, it may have some broken pieces in the back, that God is able to take the pieces of your history and even as Stephen demonstrated from Abraham to Joseph to Moses to David to Solomon to Jesus, the ups and downs of that history, God wove all that things together so that as one writer says, he works all things together for good to those who love God. God can take your history, my history, the broken pieces of it, where you are now, the disappointments. If you believe in the God of history, that he's sovereign over all, have that conviction. Yeah, I didn't get accepted. I'm not accepted into graduate school. You're going to get three white slips before you get turned down for your fourth job. Maybe you won't even get a job when you finally apply for a job. Do you believe in the God of history? Do you believe in God is sovereign? Do you believe that if you get turned down for that position, you get turned down to your first three graduate schools, that God is still in control? How are you handling disappointments and brokenness? Stephen had a conviction. God is a God of history. Therefore, he's a God of my story as well. The third thing that I see is Stephen's conviction. Not only did he believe that God is the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, he believed that not only that God is a God of history, he had a conviction. And that third conviction if I can remember it. <laughs> what was that third conviction? Let me just see here. He had the conviction that God keeps his promises. See, Abraham had made, God had made a promise to Abraham. He reaffirmed it through the prophets. And all the way through scripture, you see God making promises. And Stephen banked his life on the conviction, God is a man of his word. God is a person. His word abides forever. His truth is there. And when God said to Abraham, when God said to Joseph, when God said to David, I will be with you, Stephen developed a conviction. I believe God keeps his promises. That's a conviction. And therefore, whatever God says in his word, he will do. And therefore, David, the sea will is confident. If they stole me, I'm going to be in his presence. There's something larger than my own life. There's a larger story that is out there that I'm sharing in. Therefore, if I am killed for what I've just said, there's a larger story. God keeps his promises. He knew how to live. He knew how to die. Stephen was that man who had a person of conviction, a person who believed in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He had the convictions concerning the promises of God. He had a conviction concerning the history and the sovereignty of God. What a desire for you students as you move out into your world, as you eventually leave this place and move into graduate school and on beyond in industry into the academy, that you're going to be men and women of conviction. That you're going to be a part of a larger story. Your little story is going to be connected to a grand narrative, to God's story. But you're going to be a part of being a change agent, of changing this world to be a better place. But beyond that, you're going to have that hope that is beyond, that you are part of the king and what he's doing, part of the restoration, which is we see a glimmer of now, but it's going to come in its full glory when the king returns. And there will be a full shalom and a wholeness that's going to reign over this new heavens and the new earth. And you're part of that story. God invites us to be part of that story. And you're invited to be a participant with him. I love the way in which, in the message that uh, Eugene Peterson wrote, I love the introduction to each of his books. This is what he says at the beginning of the book of Acts. The story of Jesus doesn't end with Jesus. It continues in the lives of those who believe in him. The supernatural does not stop with Jesus. Luke makes it clear that these Christians he wrote about we're not mere spectators of Jesus. And Jesus was a spectator of God. They are in on the action of God. God acting in them. God living in them. Which is also means, of course, in us. D. 
you grasp the reality. Yes, we live in a broken world. We live in a broken universe. Things are not the way they should be. And things eventually <coughs> will be made right. And that's the hope that we have. Are you a man or woman of conviction? Who's a part of that plan that God is orchestrating? God invites you in the person of Jesus to be part of his kingdom, to be part of the solution, and to have a grand story and a grand climax to your life and for this universe and for this world in which we live. I invite you to be a follower of Jesus. If you want to be a distinctive leader, a profound leader, who is an influencer on your generation, learn the art of following. Follow Jesus. For when he was here, he said very simply, Peter, follow me. Andrew, follow me. I invite you to follow Jesus in his kingdom. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Chuck. Um, so what we're going to do now is turn to the people sitting next to you. Yeah, and speak uh, loudly. I've got a hearing loss, and so I may not hear you. But if I don't hear you, the guy behind you is Paul Epp, and he's got all the answers, too. And Dave is back there in the back row, and he's got answers. And uh, uh, Charles Pick is up here. So anyway, yeah. So, uh... What do you think is our religion in general? What is religion? I would say that, uh, I'll give you a short answer to that question. I think that religion is probably man's attempt to connect with something beyond himself. It's something that beyond transcendent. Um, religion is, is a part of, I think, the hard wiring that we have as humans. Um, the Bible teaches that we're made in the image of God, and so there is a, a, a consciousness of something beyond our own humanity. And so I think that uh, religion is, is man's attempt to make that connection beyond ourselves. Um, and that can, be, that can go in any kind of direction, but I think it appeals to a core desire that is there. spoke a lot about conviction, and I was wondering, for those of us who want to become more convicted, how you would encourage us or how would you advise us to do so? How to develop convictions, eh? Yeah. <clears throat> I, would, uh, I would start by developing good relationships with those who disagree with you. And, uh, and ask yourself, how well am I responding to what they have to say and what their questions are? For those of you who are followers of Jesus, you may have a tendency to huddle yourselves among those who believe just like you do. And so it's always healthy to develop relationships with those who disagree with us and see how well they're responding to what you have to say. Those convictions, I think, can be born out of those kind of conversations as well as taking advantage of some of the great books that are out there and some of the great scholars that are out there. So focus in on, on your own convictions in terms of building a, because the great commandment is to love God with all of your mind, as well as your heart and your soul. And I think there's a real tendency these days not to have a deep, some have described Christianity as being very wide, but being about an inch deep. And so convictions are developed by a robust mental exercise in terms of knowing what I believe and why I believe it, what we would call apologetics. And so take advantage of the good scholarship that is out there, as well as learning from your own mistakes. Um, <clears throat> life and life's experiences become some of our best teachers. Um, and so just what am I learning in life? and. Uh, and then testing those convictions against the realities that I come up against. So, good question, yes? Uh, so the title of your talk is The Gospel, so I was just wondering, what is the gospel? 
That's a great question. It's a, it's a big question. And the gospel, you know, another word for the gospel is good news. And, uh, and that's why the angel said to the shepherd, I bring you good news of great joy. And so good news, just by the nature of what news is that is good, it brings joy. I mean, if I were to tell you, hey, I got some news for you. You just won the New York State Lottery and your tuition's take care of the next four That's good news. That's gospel, right? That's gospel. So the gospel is simply good news. And so the good news is that this core desire that I have, that, that, that I just can't seem to get out of sight of me in terms of some of the ultimate questions that I have, is that there, there, there is a perspective that is beyond myself. And so it's a good news that takes the, I'll use my word again, the brokenness of my own life, the brokenness of my own experiences, and to the shepherds when they said, this is peace, this is shalom. That's the Old Testament word, shalom, which means wholeness or peace. So there's a peace that the Bible says passes all understanding. And so the gospel meets us at our deepest needs of, of a brokenness both with a creator, with myself. I'm disappointed in myself. I don't like myself. I don't like how I've been made. It begins to heal that. It begins to heal my relationships with other people. And so the gospel is good news in terms of reconciling my relationship with God, my relationship with myself, and my relationship with others. Jesus came, and the most frequent word that he uses is, I've come that you might have life. And so anything that leaves Jesus out apparently isn't real life. So Jesus comes and he says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have more of it. That's good news. Now to have that kind of a life, another word that he uses, which we don't hear much at all at Cornell, is the word that starts with R. It's called repent. I don't think in any place on this campus, especially in the Daily Sun, you're going to see the word repent. When I read some of the editorials at Cornell Daily Sun, there's a huge need for repentance on this campus. Now, repentance is simply this. You're going in one direction, and you change directions. And that's what the word repentance means. It means the change of my mind, the change of an attitude. And so whatever view I may have of Jesus, as I understand more about him, and Stephen studied Jesus, and I begin to make Jesus my focus, I'm going to change my view about him. He's not just a great moral teacher. He wasn't some kind of a prophet. I'm coming to see that he really was who he claimed to be, the Son of God. That's a repentance. That's a change. I come to recognize that there is something wrong with me, that when God says, I want you to be like this, that I need to change. Okay, I'm going to change my heart and change my perspective. So the gospel is the good news that begins to do an overhaul of my whole self, beginning with my heart, my mind, and my spirit. It's a change of life. Um, so why do um, so why do people study apologetics and theology? Why do people study apologetics? Uh, yeah. I didn't hear your last phrase. But, uh, why do people study apologetics and theology? I think people study apologetics, and honestly, your generation is coming to shift back to that study of apologetics, because some of us <clears throat> used to go to conferences decades ago in which there was uh, an university was really, I mean, it used to be when I was in college, that if you wanted to go to a good Bible study, you go to university. If you wanted to go to evangelism, you go to crusade. If you wanted to become a disciple of Jesus, you go to the navigators. And if you want to become an all-around person, you go to CBS or Asia. Or Asia. <laughs> <laughs> and so, historically, IV has always been this, that, you know, that's, don't take this first much else. IV was where those who, the nerds went there. <laughs> that's not true. That's not true. But, but honestly, if you really want to develop a robust worldview, that's where you go. So apologetics is an understanding of when the Bible tells us, be ready to give an answer, a reason answer, the hope that lies within you. It becomes a rational response. I'm gonna I'm gonna go beyond my my area of, of knowledge a little bit in answer to your question, because I'm just kind of probing this. There's a writer that I really appreciate. It's called Dallas Willard. He's written a book on knowledge. 
And he went, he's written a whole book in terms of the difference between knowledge and faith. And he thinks that there's been a separation between those two. During the last hundred years or so, faith has become divorced from knowledge. It's an unhealthy separation. So the faith is that which is more experiential, and knowledge is out there. And he uses the phrase secular knowledge. What is secular knowledge? You're trying to deal with such philosophical areas as reality and so on. And so he's really arguing we need to come back to understand that faith is not the absence of knowledge. It is rooted in knowledge. It is faith based upon something. It's not some kind of Kierkegaardian leap in the dark, you know, a leap out there. It's, it's loving God with my mind, heart, soul. And so it's really knowledge-based. And so I really come to know God. So that Paul says, I know whom I have believed, as well as in Colossians 2, I know what I believe. Apologetics is the understanding of the rationale, the rationality of what I believe and why I believe. And so it satisfies the deepest, curious mystery of my mind and how I can understand things. There are some things that are going to be beyond understanding because God is infinite. There are some things that I just quite don't understand, but it's like any kind of a science. The more I probe into it, the more I, 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 I dig into the scriptures. And so as you read the Bible, you're going to continue to read it more and more and more. You understand more about Jesus. And it's curious. I mean, this morning, I was reading a phrase in a group that I'm a part of. And I never saw a word before. And I simply said, huh, I never quite saw that before. I've read this passage hundreds of times. But there's something dynamic about the scriptures. To all of a sudden, you read it and say, true. I never saw that before. The depth of understanding who God is and what he's written. Apologetics gives me a rationale for how I believe and why I believe. Uh, something that you said uh, before was that uh, Stephen knew how to die for that reason, he knew how to live. I guess, like, could you elaborate on that for us? Um, to be honest with you, that's a quote from Billy Graham. I just realized that that's what Billy Graham would say. So I give credit to Billy Graham at this point. Um, because I think that uh, Stephen, in, in your response, and he really mirrors how Jesus died. Because on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jeez, in the agony of crucifixion. Does it? And so there's a similarity between Stephen as he prays, and, and he's so confident in terms of, of his, his imminent death, that he's, he's able to say what he did say. And so I think that by having that hope that goes beyond my life, if I am that confident in the passage from this life to the next life, that's going to give me a high degree of confidence in the life that I'm currently living. And so if I really know how to grapple with that, which is a profound mystery, of the step from time into eternity, that's going to give me a greater confidence in what now experience as time. Your expression tells me I didn't connect at all. Um, um, <laughs> uh, let's see, how can I back up on that one? Um, if death remains a mystery to us, and it's a time of uncertainty. Um, like the psalmist says in a very familiar psalm, he says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear not. I will fear no evil. So there's a certain fear that we have of the dying process. And therefore, we dress it up, we deny it. Um, none of you right now even thinks about death. You know, that's way out there. And so we just kind of, we, we, we use the words passing on, we, we just, we almost deny its existence. Now if you begin to really look at the reality of death, and the reality that that is coming, that's one thing that we all will share in. And I face that which remains as one of the ultimate mysteries. And it's a, it's a passage that does provoke anxiety or fear or uncertainty. If I come to the place where I no longer fear, I'm going to grasp what the Good Shepherd tells me. I will fear no evil, though I walk through the valley, and I will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm going to be confident. If I can be confident, arguing from the greater to the lesser, if I can be confident in that passage, wait, I can be confident in this passage. Thanks for nodding that way. Yeah. <laughs> hey, one more question. Uh, you can do that too, all right, yeah, come right here.
Because so what about dying daily? So when you say you pick up your coffee daily, right? Yeah. So not what if, what about not physical death, as in like something that's worried about when we're eighty, but what about dying daily as a student or when we go to a job or just dying daily? Some of you feel like you're dying daily here at Cornell. Don't you? <laughs> 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 it's freezing to death. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, the question is, uh, what does it mean to die daily? And uh, and I think that uh, the the essence of a follower of Jesus is that I and true love is 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 not living for the benefit of myself, but always living with an other's orientation. And therefore, I live, as Jesus called himself, the servant. Uh, who, as the scripture says, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a, as a ransom for many. I think to die daily is to live my life in such a way that my life is a gift to others. I die to my own aspirations. That doesn't mean that I don't have dreams. It doesn't mean that I don't have ambitions. But I think that it matters. It's, it's not asking the question, what do I want? But is, as Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives through me. So if Christ is going to live through me, it's Christ living his life through me. And I say to Chuck, Chuck, that's maybe what you want to do. What is it that Christ wants to do through you? The longer the life that I no longer live, I live unto myself, and to him who loved me, and gave himself for me. Okay. Hey, Chris? Let's uh, do one more round of applause.